Okay, can you see my first slide up? Not yet. How about yes. now? Perfect. Okay, there. All right. That's the that's actually not the first one. So I have to back up one for some reason. Um, just a second here. Yeah. Okay, that's what I wanted. All right, so everybody can see the screen, I assume. Can yes. you hear me? And yes. you can hear me? Yes. Okay, yesterday when Lisa and I talked at three o'clock, I was having a real issue with sound. So I've been a little nervous about whether I was going to have sound or not, but it looks like we're in pretty good shape. So Okay, well, let's start really with why I'm doing these presentations and how I got involved in all this. Um, and it's the story of a lot of people uh, who are into Purple Martins now. I had an uncle who had Purple Martins in Caseville along Lake Huron as a, when I was a child. And that was my first exposure to those. And of course, it was the white and green house that everybody sees. And, you know, it's like, oh, you know, that's a Purple Martin house. Uh, so we put a house up, um, a, a very traditional Purple Martin house on our lake property down here in Vicksburg, which is south of Kalamazoo. And we got Purple Martins right away. And the reason we did, I'm sure, is because there were other Purple Martin landlords, that's what we call ourselves, there were other Purple Martin landlords on the lake. That was 1985 and it was really easy then. Um, it's gotten more difficult to have a colony now and there are fewer Purple Martins. So um, we had this colony, I didn't do much with it except put the house up every year, take it down, clean it out, enjoy the birds flying around. Didn't really know a whole lot about Purple Martins. And then in 2010, there was a big die off across the Northern United States and we lost most of our chicks and didn't know what to do about it. But of course I was feeling very guilty. You know, what did I do wrong? Um, I went to clean out the nests and I found, I, I'll never forget the number. There were 36 dead chicks who were just starting to feather out. Uh, what had happened and I didn't know at the time but I sure learned quickly. Um, that's when I really discovered the internet, that was in 2010. Um, what I learned was that these Martins suffered greatly all across the Northern United States because they're aerial insectivores, which means that's all they eat and they, and they catch their prey on the fly. They can't go to the ground or they don't go to a tree uh, to find bugs, they catch them in the air. And uh, there was a shortage of bugs because we had a really wet, rainy July. And so I learned what happened and I decided that was never gonna happen at my colony again. And long story short, 12 years later, I'm doing these presentations and heavily managing my colony now. So uh, I've also become a master naturalist since then. And it's kind of pulled me heavily into the whole environmental picture. Uh, but I'm sticking with Purple Martins. They're the most enjoyable bird I've come across. They like humans and they have to have humans in order to survive. And that's the interesting thing about the Purple Martin is without man-made housing, or I should say person-made housing, um, the, the, the Martin won't nest anywhere. You know, they've, they've evolved to that point. So with that in mind, I'm gonna give you a lot of pictures of Purple Martins. I'm gonna tell you some basics. I'm also gonna show you how people, um, and there are thousands of people across the United States on the east side of the Rockies, a lot of farmers down in the south um, who are doing what they can to keep the numbers up and, and not have this bird disappear. Um, all right, I start out with this uh, John James Audubon, 
one of his paintings and shows the purple martins and the ones that are dark colored they have a purple sheen in the sun those are the males and the couple that you see on the right hand side of that picture those are the females and he had this quote which i found interesting another really odd thing we went on a cruise about seven or eight years ago and i went to the library of the ship this is a true story i can't believe it so i pulled a book off that was a book by John James Audubon. It was a, an old book and it was kind of cool. And I'm like, oh, this is neat. And so I flipped it open and unbelievably it opened up to his Purple Martin section. It was like, how the heck did this happen? But that really did happen. So I keep telling myself I'm destined to do this with the Purple Martins. So he said, almost every country tavern has a Martin box. And I can't read the whole thing because there are people's pictures over it. So maybe you folks can read his quote. Um, I have observed that the handsomer the box, the better does the inn generally prove to be. That was 1831. Purple Martins were everywhere. It was cool to have a Purple Martin house up. Um, they were considered city birds. And I mean, they were extremely numerous. And we've gone from that to now, I think uh, the current statistic is we have about 10% of the population that we had at that time. So the numbers have greatly diminished. All right, let's see, I gotta figure out how to. This is my first Purple Martin Zoom presentation. So bear with me. Okay, this is just a really nice picture of the male. Some of you may know the name Josh Hass. He's a big environmentalist. He's been president of the Battle Creek Audubon for years down here. And this is one of his photos that he got of a purple martin and he said, use it wherever you want. So here it is. It really shows the male and it shows the purple on the male. The wings tend to be more black, especially when they're in flight. The more sun that lands on the bird, the purpler the male looks. And here's another picture of the male. And he has in his mouth, uh, this is one of my birds, a friend, Karen Brown in Michiana Audubon. Uh, I've had that club come out three times now to see the birds. And she took this amazing picture along with some others. And again, you can see he's got a dragonfly in his mouth and that is their uh, what shall I say? They're happy prey. If they can get dragonflies, they're really, really happy. And they will feed a big dragonfly to their chicks. And it's just amazing to watch these little chicks swallow a dragonfly like that. Um, notice that the bird has the long tail. It's a swallow and it has the long uh, graceful wings. It has dark feet. And in a little while, we'll get a better look at its beak. A lot of people mix the purple martin up with starlings, which just totally freaks me out, but they do. Um, and it's partly because they're dark like that. But if you look at the wings um, and the beak and the dark feet instead of the yellow feet, um, you know, you can tell the difference without too much trouble. This is the female. She's got uh, what looks like a damselfly in her mouth. And they are actually, both of these birds are sitting on my gourd rack, um, just sitting up there kind of waiting for us to move a little bit away from the gourd rack so they can come down and feed their chicks. Notice she's got sort of a mottled chest and she's really a brownish color. Uh, she doesn't have any purple on her at all for obvious reasons. She needs to stay more camouflaged. Well, the male, uh, you know, he kind of works as the, uh, the uh, protector and, you know, uh, keeps away prey and so on by not just flying and so on, but also his appearance is more striking. Oops. This one, I love this picture. This is another Karen Brown picture. This is a purple martin that is called a subadult. He would have been hatched last year. And it is definitely a male, but you need to look, if you can look, it's a pretty good picture. You can see the purple feathering coming in. 
and there's some purple feathers down here. Um, he's gonna look like that all summer long. He can mate. He's a little bit of a troublemaker. Sometimes these sub-adult males cause problems in the colony and will actually kill babies of another pair if they can, which sounds pretty awful. But the reason they do it is they want to mate. And they come last to our area. The first birds to arrive are the adults, usually adult males. But uh, this guy, he won't show up. Uh, the younger birds show up generally about the end of the first week in May, where the other birds uh, start arriving as early as March 26th. That's the earliest I've ever had birds here in my area. You folks up there probably wouldn't see birds until at least the end of the first week in April, and then it would just be one or two. Uh, more than likely, you wouldn't get them up there until mid-April. You can see his beak here. He's got the beak of, a, of an aerial, of an insectivore. It's kind of a hooked beak. And of course the dark eyes, and he also will have the dark feet, but he looks more like a female. A lot of people get him confused if they don't really know what they're looking for. This is just a house that I, I thought it was really cool. A senior community uh, had a workshop in it and the men in the senior community built this cool house. And I went up there and I did a presentation for them and we had this big ceremony and they erected the house uh, I don't remember exactly what city it was. It was somewhere south of Muskegon, uh, right along uh, Lake Michigan. And it's, it's an accurate, correct purple martin house for attracting purple martins. It happens to be made out of wood, so it's a little bit heavy because a real purple martin landlord who really is managing the martins will definitely want to be able to raise and lower the house to check on what's going on in the nest cavities. Uh, also notice the, uh, the, the arched openings where the birds nest. The reason they're like that instead of round is starlings can't get into those. If you have a round hole, you have a, star a starling problem. Unfortunately, house sparrows can still get into these. Um, so if you're gonna have purple martins nowadays, you have to be willing to help the purple martins fight off the house sparrows. That's uh, sort of one of the unpleasant parts about being a purple martin landlord. And a lot of people, I used to hesitate to tell people, well, how do you do that? Well, frankly, everybody has their own way of doing it. I try to be humane, but I do kill them when I get a hold of them. You know, they, they will destroy an entire colony, one male, house sparrow can wipe out every chick in this little house here. So that's kind of something to keep in mind um, if you're gonna be a Purple Martin landlord and you have house sparrows in the area. Starlings aren't as much a problem because you're gonna put up a house that has these kind of openings or a couple of other kinds. Okay, here we have the male and female sitting here together. And this slideshow, I just want to say, is loosely, uh, is loosely adapted from one that I purchased from the Purple Martin Conservation Association some years ago. But here's a good picture of the purple. This is why they're called Purple Martins. You really see the purple in the sun. And this is the female over here. And she has a little glint of purple on her, but not very much. Um, both of these birds build the nest. They, they act as a real team. And you know they might take a different mate next year. It's not like these two guys stay together their whole lives. Every year they take a different mate. Um, kind of the first one to the colony uh, gets the best choice. I guess that's how it works. So the male, and well, the first birds to arrive starting the end of March down here, um, they're called scouts, but they aren't coming to scout out housing for anybody but themselves. What they're attempting to do is arrive at the colony where they were successful last year in raising a family. So uh, they will try to get there first and then they get dibs on whichever opening they want, depending on how many are available. 
Um, they'll oftentimes go right back to the very same hole in a, a colony with 12 to 24 to 28 or more um, nest cavities. The female um, is the one that sits on the eggs. Um, the male will sit on the eggs, but he can only keep them warm and watch for predators. He can't actually brood them. Um, so, but remember, the female has to go out and eat. So she has to leave her eggs. So she'll leave her eggs. Her, her guy will go into the, the cavity and he'll sit, keep the birds warm, babysit a little bit if they're chicks. Um, but uh, she's the one that does, does the brooding. And then um, uh, once they have chicks, they both feed. And it's pretty interesting to watch. I mean, you can, you can watch these birds all day long. I can't believe how much time I can spend just sitting down there watching my birds. But most of you folks can probably appreciate that because you're all bird people. Okay, I just wanna remind everybody what citizen science is because without the term citizen science or the idea of citizen science, Purple Martins would probably not exist east of the Rocky Mountains. Because remember, at the very least, a human being has to erect proper housing. But if you were to ever go on the website or go onto Facebook and find out how totally crazy some people are about making sure their, their babies, all their birds are, are kept safe. And people spend a lot of money taking care of them. Um, and they spend a lot of time erecting housing and so on and so forth. So a citizen scientist is a volunteer. Um, they work with scientists and researchers to further the knowledge of whatever they're working on. Um, the Purple Martin Conservation Association in Erie, Pennsylvania uh, has been there for 35 years now. Their sole purpose is Purple Martins and they do all kinds of research. They get a lot of federal grants. They've got a following now in Brazil because that's where most of the birds go every year. Um, and then of course, everybody's probably familiar with Cornell Lab of Ornithology, National Geographic and a lot of other organizations that are encouraging people to do citizen science, not just with Purple Martins, but all the way around. Okay, this is just a little advertisement for the Purple Martin Conservation Association. If anybody in the audience is really interested in trying to establish a colony and you could establish one in your area, um, you're not too far north. Um, there are actually Purple Martins in Ontario and Rogers City, which is almost exactly across from Petoskey, on Lake, Huron, on Lake uh, Huron, there is a place called the Purple Martin Inn and they have a very uh, well-established colony and you can go and stay there and enjoy their Purple Martins. But this organization, what I love about it is they actually have somebody who answers the telephone when you call them and they will answer any question that you would have and they'll refer you to mentors of which I am one in your area if you need some kind of assistance. So it's just a great organization. There's all kinds of information available through them. And that's what I discovered in 2010 when I was quite sick because I had lost all those babies. Okay, I don't know, this is just a slide I put in here. I have been heavily involved in Audubon Society of Kalamazoo. Uh, the year I was president was the anniversary of the death of the last passenger pigeon. Um, this is the passenger pigeon, and there were literally billions of these in the United States, and humans pretty much killed them out in 100 years. That's all it took. This is the last one, and um, uh, there, she, there she is. So I don't want this to happen to Purple Martins, and none of us want this to happen to other birds, which is why I think so many people now are kind of getting interested because the importance of birds, I sort of believe in the canary in the coal mine theory. Okay, these are my, these are some birds from my colony and this is an older picture. I know it's an older picture because when I look up here, I had round holes on my gourds 
And then I converted. After I became enlightened on what I needed to do, um, thank goodness I have a husband who's willing to help me with a lot of kind of heavy duty work with regard to the rigging and so on. But I, uh, I blocked this hole and put a proper uh, starling resistant uh, opening uh, this is a male. This bird here is actually a decoy. A uh, good purple martin landlord will put decoys up and they serve a couple purposes. From the air, and purple martins are extremely high flyers. They've been seen as high as 3,000 feet in the air and they wear little GPS harnesses that are put on usually by Purple Martin Conservation Association. Um, so, uh, you know, we've learned a lot from those, but these decoys will make a uh, purple martin looking for a colony thinks there's a martin down there and they're groupies. So they'll come flying down, check out the decoy, and then they'll see, oh, there's a nice cavity. Let me check that out. And hopefully the next thing you know, you know, they'll move in. That would be really nice. They've got to find a mate, move in, so on and so forth. Um, the other thing this bird does, this decoy, and I have about eight of them, I'd say, on my colony. Um, <clears throat> if a hawk or an owl decides to do an attack, the other birds, because they're in a collection, they, they warn each other. And the only bird that doesn't leave is the decoy. And I had Kalamazoo Audubon Society come out one evening, and we were sitting there watching the Purple Martins. Believe it or not, all of a sudden, the birds got kind of crazy. And a Cooper's hawk came flying down and grabbed onto one of those guys and kind of hung on for a minute with his feet, like, well, what's, what's the deal? And then he flew off. By then, all of the bir other birds had flown to safety. This is a really nice colony. The man's name is Tom Fisher. He went to a workshop in the Tawas area that I did. And he had a wonderful colony already established, but he, I think he just came because he loves the birds and he wanted a little more advice on how to keep his colony alive and well. Uh, so there are a couple other colonies in the Tawas area. And that's one of the things we're trying to do is find out where all these colonies are, which is not all that easy. Uh, but uh, this man had a beautiful colony and I really enjoyed him being involved. So here's just, you know, okay, why are aerial insectivores important? Well, natural insect control, um, control of invasive insects. They uh, have been, they've been known to fly. This happened above Missouri. Missouri was having a big problem with fire ants apparently. And they found purple martins as high as a thousand feet in the air, uh, feeding on queen fire ants up there. And that was kind of a big, uh, a big discovery. Uh, they also, these GPS harnesses tell, tell scientists a lot about what's going on up in the upper atmosphere. And of course, then the environmental trends that'll impact us all. We're learning a lot from Purple Martins about that. And really the, the reason why people, I guess, wanna have them the most is they're just so much fun to watch. They're swallows. The biggest of the swallows, they have aerial antics that are just pretty unbelievable. So uh, those are the reasons why, if you need a reason for why to save a bird, those are my reasons. This is a rig that I no longer have this set up exactly like this, but I now have two colonies. We bought some property in the Menden area on the St. Joe River down where, um, the Amish live and the Amish down in our area, just north of uh, Indiana, they have a lot of purple martins. And so I decided to establish another colony when we bought this property down there. And after four years, it took us four years, we finally got purple martins. But you can see it's the traditional green and white house. Um, this thing here is a feeding tray. I feed my purple martins in bad weather. And for purple martins, bad weather means no bugs. No bugs means no food. Um, even though they are aerial insectivores, it is possible to train purple martins to eat out of a tray 
if the tray is up high. Uh, there are people who use slingshots and fire fresh frozen thawed crickets up in the air. Uh, some people will throw them up in the air out of a bucket. Some people feed scrambled eggs. Um, I didn't have any luck with the slingshot deal. Um, so I just was very uh, diligent and eventually I got a couple birds to eat out of the tray and now they'll all eat out of the tray. And feeding them like that is not gonna make them dependent on tray food because I've tried several times feeding them when it's a nice day, they won't eat out of the tray. They'll only eat out of the tray if they haven't gotten enough food and they have hungry chicks or perhaps um, it's been either super windy, which makes bugs rare. Uh, it can be very cold, below 55 degrees. It can be extremely dry or extremely wet. All of those conditions cause problems for purple martins. We live on a lake that has a lot of natural wetland. And so we have a lot of bugs over here. Um, in particular, we have a lot of dragonflies. But even with that, I, I gotta tell you, I spend probably, well, in bad years, probably almost $500 a year just buying crickets and mealworms to feed my birds. So I have a lot of birds and it's my hobby. You know, people think I'm crazy, but I'm like, I'm not a hunter. I don't spend money on bullets. Um, I spend money on crickets. So um, it's, it's pretty rewarding to see a bunch of purple martins coming to this feeding tray. And sometimes I put, I put bugs up here. I put crickets up there um, or mealworms. Um, when you start, you can put them on these porches that are on the gourds but I just have to put them in the tray now. Once in a while, I'll throw some up here. So you can see this rig has a pulley system on it. And I'll show you another picture where there's another one. Um, you can bring it down to your level. It doesn't bother the birds at all. I mean, lots of times they'll stay right there. Sometimes they fly, um, but they're used to me. They actually get to know their, their uh, landlords. Um, so they're, they're not going to leave your, your colony if you're around. In fact, they want people to be around. I've also got my colonies, all my, my uh, gourds are all numbered. Um, you do that because if you're going to manage the birds, you're going to look in each nest cavity at least once every five days. And if you have issues, maybe more often than that. And you're gonna find all kinds of things in there. Hopefully nothing is wrong, but sometimes there's something going on in there and you wanna take care of that. So what could be going on? Well, you might've had a lot of rain. So now the nest cavity is really wet. So when the nest cavity gets really wet, believe it or not, you change out the nest. And um, it's just what uh, people do to try to prevent the chicks from getting wing rot and dying. So the other thing that can happen is you might find a dead chick in there that contaminates the nest. You wanna get that out. Uh, while the eggs are hatching, there's something called a capped egg where maybe chick number one hatched, but when he hatched, his half of the egg kind of glommed on to the end of somebody else's egg. And now that baby chick can't get out because it's got a double shell on the one end. So when you see that, you just have to very carefully pull that cap from the other egg off and then the chick can get out. And hopefully you've done it in time before the baby dies in the egg. Um, so, uh, you know, those are all kinds of different things that you can find going on in there. Uh, once you get chicks, you keep track of those chicks. Um, like if you have seven eggs, um, five of them might hatch, maybe all seven will hatch, but you need to discard the eggs that didn't hatch because again, those will rot in the nest. The reason why this is so important with purple martins is for a small bird, and they only weigh about two ounces at the most, uh, they spend at least 30 days in the nest before they fly. And that's a long, long time for a small bird. The reason is when they leave the nest, they have to leave flying. 
If they land on the ground, they're in a lot of trouble because the parents will not go on the ground to feed them. The ground is a dangerous place and it's all about uh, preservation of the species. So here's a, a rig, again, very similar to the other one. Um, I've enlarged my housing. This originally had 12 cavities in it, but what they've learned through research is that purple martins need a bigger cavity than the little six by six cavity that this 12 nest box house has originally had. So what you do is you just drill out between two cavities and now the chicks have basically a two room flat. Um, they really like that. They'll actually build their nest in the back cavity or the side cavity. And then they kind of have a living room where they can come through the hole and wander around um, I cap the main hole off. You can see here is the entrance hole and here's the other part. They're both number four. Um, and that allows actually, now I've turned my 12 cavity house into a six cavity house, but I actually get a larger clutch in there. So in the end, you actually have as many or more chicks and there's a much better chance of the chicks surviving. So there's directions on how to do this. It's quite simple. You just go to Purple Martin Conservation Association or contact me. I got all kinds of information, but you just use a hole saw, a two inch hole saw, and you just drill and then sand it down so the birds don't get hurt on rough edges. And this is what you get. So this metal thing here is an owl hawk guard. Um, those are really important. I have not had, well, I've had owls try to get into my nest. My neighbor, they don't do anything to guard their nest. And so they've had hawk and owl tax, attacks quite frequently. So whatever you put up, you wanna try to have hawk and owl protection. Um, you can see this thing here and this thing here. Those are also hawk owl guards for these gourds. And one year I did actually have, I just had this little one here, which is supposed to be successful, but I did have a hawk attack, a Cooper's hawk attack. And I heard all kinds of commotion outside one morning and I went running out there. I knew something was wrong. The hawk ended up flying away. And this is a really kind of a sick thing to tell you folks, but the hawk had managed, there, was, there were babies in there and they were laying there with their little heads out, getting some fresh air. And a hawk managed to get the head. He decapitated one of the chicks. And that's when I said to my husband the next winter, we're gonna put double hawk owl guards on now. So now almost all my gourds have both this one and this one. And so it's much more difficult to get in. So, um, you know, there's always a way you can figure out what to do. This little box hanging here is actually, it's a, it's a solar light and it blinks red at night. And that's designed to keep owls away. So I try to hang them on my, on my cavities on Barton Lake where we live, where we've got fairly close neighbors. I try to hang them so they, they don't show from the lakeside because I don't want my neighbors you know, getting mad at me or something because there's this little teeny blinking light blinking all night long. Uh, but that's another way that you can avoid uh, losing your chicks. Um, this opening is a different kind of starling resistant opening. I don't like it as well. And I've kind of converted more to the crescents because I actually had a pair of starlings build a nest in that, even though they're not supposed to. And uh, what happened was the female seemed to be smaller than normal. And so she got in and I watched him build the nest. She got in there and the male starling delivered nesting material to her. And then she'd take it at the opening and she'd go in and she'd build her nest. And so after they got their nest built, I did eradicate the starlings. So, um, they don't belong there. Uh, they can do great damage to purple martins. And as you know, house sparrows 
and European starlings are invasive birds and they are damaging a lot of our native species. Uh, let's see. Okay, this is a, this is a, it looks like this might be a, um, a decoy. And this little decoy here is laying down. And I do have problems here and there, you know, it's like, darn that decoy, you know, it, it, it just doesn't want to stay up. So I'm constantly adjusting my decoys. But you can see I've got quite a few birds sitting up here. Here's a nice picture. This was taken by a gal who brought her children to visit the colony this last summer. And in the middle, this happens to be one of those subadult males. This is a female. This is a female, but this is a subadult. See that feathering right there on its chest? That's a purple feather starting to come in. So this guy's starting to get his purple feathers. He's got more down there. And if you look on his head, he's got purple feathers here and there. And he can be a bit of a troublemaker, like I said. This is what happened with purple martins. The Native Americans kind of got started. They had them in their, in their uh, uh, villages to eat the bugs and also just for entertainment. They didn't have TV sets and technology back then. So uh, they would just watch the Purple Martins and enjoy them and hung up these native natural gourds. And then when the white man came, he built his houses and you can see up here, a Purple Martin house. And they got these ideas, of course, from the Native Americans but it was very common for the Martin house to be pretty ornate and look a lot like the house that they lived in. And you can see the ladder so they can climb up there and clean the house up. Um, a lot of old pictures from the 1800s and a little earlier, you'll see a purple Martin house in the yard. You know, they, they were very common back then. This is Griggsville, Illinois. Has anybody ever been there? Okay, Griggsville, Illinois, they were considered the Purple Martin capital of the country. And they had this, this is really true, it's hard to believe. This was a tower of Purple Martins. It goes way high in the air. They took that one down, it was the JCs that erected it, and they put up a new one in 1991. Well, I had a son who lived in Kansas, and so we had to drive right by Griggsville to get there. So I stopped in one time about 10 years ago, and I'm sorry to say that the company that makes this trio metal house moved out of town. And so the Purple Martins kind of uh, went by the wayside, I guess you could say. It was kind of a disappointment to me, but about three years ago, I made a connection with uh, a group of men who live in that community and they are reviving the Purple Martin situation. They don't, that this tower is still up. I don't believe they're using it. And I have no idea how they ever would have cleaned that thing out, but um, I saw it with my own eyes. It was really there. Um, that's sort of the sad story of uh, Purple Martins disappearing from a community. Everybody still hearing me? Okay, this is Phil Donahue's colony and he's got a colony or had a colony. I don't know if he's still there. Frankly, I don't even know if he's still alive, but this was his colony on the coast of Connecticut and he had uh, a camera in there so people could go on gazebophil.com and they could look at one of the cameras in one of his gourds. This was uh, right along the coast there in Connecticut. This is Martha Stewart. She had a very prominent Purple Martin landlord visit her one time. And he got, he got two minutes, two big minutes to say as much as he could about Purple Martins on her show. And so her interest was because this is a natural gourd. And this Larry, uh, and I've forgotten his last name and I can't see it because of all the pictures of everybody. Um, he's from Kentucky and he got into Purple Martins because his grandfather had him, then his father had him, Larry Melcher, his last name is. And he's now, I'm pretty sure, still the president of the Purple Martin Conservation Association in uh, Erie, Pennsylvania. 
And he, uh, I didn't hear him when he was on there, but you can see this was kind of a big deal. And uh, Martha was kind of doing her thing with uh, natural gourds. This is where the purple martins go each year. As soon as they're done nesting, they start to gather in roosts. And my purple martins do not all go down together. Um, if you can imagine what that would do to a colony if they run into bad weather or something. So like if uh, I have five pair, they finished raising their chicks, they kind of head out into the trees and look for other purple martins. And uh, then when they gather a large group um, of several thousand purple martins, uh, even as many as 100,000 some of these roosts are, they head south and this is where they go. So, you know, the rainforest disappearing down here is going to do a lot of damage to purple martins along with other birds because that's where they winter. They don't nest down there. They just go down there. They're like snowbirds. So then this little map shows the different times they come. They're actually in in Florida by the middle of January. And you can see how high up they've got, uh, you guys are kind of right, right on the line there, but there are two colonies in Escanaba. So, you know, it would be nice to see more up north. How am I doing on time? I don't wanna eight o'clock. Okay, this, this is just Doppler radar. This is how they track Purple Martins. They have a different kind of, uh, uh, what do I wanna say? A different kind of look, look when it's their group compared to other birds. And so they know if, they're, it's, if it's a purple martin uh, uh, group that's um, being picked up by Doppler radar. This is what a roost looks like. These are some things that you can use to, there's the, there's the decoy, there's charts to help you identify things. There's a magazine that comes out quarterly if you join Purple Martin Conservation Association. This is called a prognosticator and it helps me tell how old the chicks are because you don't wanna bring your gourd rack down if your chicks are too old because if you disturb the chicks, they might fly early and if they leave the nest early, remember they won't go, the parents won't go to the ground to help them out. So the last thing you wanna do is have your chicks uh, leave the nest. So this chart without showing you how to use it, but I'd be happy to show anybody that's really interested. Um, it, you, you, you can tell when the last egg is laid, you can tell when the, when the first egg is going to hatch and then you can have a pretty good idea when the chicks will start to fletch. If you've got chicks up there in your rack that are, some are older, some are younger, you can take a paper cup and put it on a string and shove that in the purple martin hole. And that will keep the chicks in the nest so they don't come out and they're not frightened. So now you can bring the rack down, you've plugged up the holes of the chicks uh, that are potentially going to leave the nest too early, then you can do what you need to do, you know, with the other nests. And then you raise the, the rack up again, wait about five to 10 minutes, and then it's got this string and you give a gentle tug and the, string, the cup will come out. I also use socks that I tie on a string. You can stick a sock up there. Okay, here I have one year we had 105 degrees for a week straight in Southern Michigan and people all over the country were getting heat waves and everybody was devising ways to try to keep the heat off the nest. I don't know if it helped or not, but it made me feel better. And I didn't really lose a lot of chicks that year. Um, some people created things with umbrellas I mean, you wouldn't believe how ornate people get with some of this stuff because they love their birds. And in fact, um, in the South, there are these wonderful farmers down there. They put a misting 
uh, a misting uh, hose going up the pole and then it mists over the house. So if it gets too hot and especially in the south, they turn their mister on and they cool their birds off. The birds love the mist. You've seen birds in the rain before and it keeps them cooler. And of course, the whole idea is not to have anything happen to those chicks in the nest. This is a feeding tray. I have a tray like this and there's mealworms in there. By the way, what I do, I, I use live mealworms. I keep them in my garage and I order them a couple times a year. And then I have to feed the mealworms to keep them alive. They really like the live mealworms. So I order crickets in the spring and I order them like 10,000 crickets at a time and they come chirping at my door by UPS. And I take them down in my deep freeze and I stick them in the deep freeze until they're frozen solid. And then I jar them up in canning jars and keep them frozen the whole time. Then if an emergency occurs, too windy, too cold, uh, too hot, um, too dry, whatever it is, too wet, um, I pull those out, I thaw them out. You can thaw them out in water or you can just let them sit and they'll thaw out. And then I put them up in the feeding trays here. And I mean, I'll get like 25 birds at a time in there. I actually watched a male feed his chick one time. I counted, he made 16 consecutive trips from the feeding tray to the, uh, to the chicks. This is not my bird. This is a picture that I got somewhere. Notice the scrambled eggs. A lot of people feed scrambled eggs. I had no luck with that. My birds want crickets and mealworms. This is somebody else's house, but you can see they've thrown scrambled eggs up there to try to save as many birds as they can because these birds will not go on the ground and they won't look for bugs in trees or anything like that. Um, you know, they get pretty desperate after two days of no food. Purple martins are now about 10% of their 1880 population. Uh, why? Loss of human interest. Nobody wants to put up houses anymore. Habitat loss and degradation of the habitat. Insect decline is a big problem in a lot of areas. And we all know pesticides don't do anybody, uh, any birds, any uh, favors invasive species, in particular house sparrows and starlings, and then sort of natural predation, snakes, raccoons, cats, hawks, and that sort of thing. So this is what's happened to the purple martin since 1966. You can see it's gone way down like a lot of other birds. And this is the breeding bird atlas. This is what it looked like in 1988. This is what it looked like in 2008. And you can see that all the upper peninsula purple martins are for the most part gone. This is what the birds do after they're done nesting. They go find a tree somewhere and they create, in my case, on, on our lake, a little mini roost. So I might end up with about 300 birds hanging around together, um, getting ready to take off. Um, and that's, uh, you know, just kind of a rare picture of a bunch of birds sitting in a tree because we always think of purple martins as sitting on a gourd rack or on a wire or something like that, but they do like to hang out in dead trees. This is just somebody's um, uh, birdhouse, not mine. Um, a 50% fledgling rate from egg to fledge would be considered average. Some years you get 70% all the way up to 90%. And some years I've actually even had more than 90% of my eggs actually turn into chicks and fly away. And this is my data. It was 2009 when I lost those 36 babies. And so you can see that, you know, over the, over the years, uh, I did have a larger colony on Barton Lake. I had to reduce it for a couple of reasons. Um, and that's one reason why we now have the second colony and I don't have that data up yet because I'm getting a lot of subadults and subadults can be kind of naughty. So a lot of kind of weird stuff happens in your colony in the beginning. 
So they're backyard pets. They're very social. When I go out there to feed them or just to go sit out there, they actually fly over me. They aren't diving at me. They, they fly over. Uh, they seek out humans. In fact, if you're going to put up a purple martin house, you should put it up within, within 125 feet of a human structure where there's human activity. Dogs generally don't deter them. They will dive bomb dogs, but it's not going to chase them away. Uh, we have a dog. Our neighbors have a dog. Uh, the big problem is if there are cats in the area. But for Purple Martins, who don't typically go on the ground, it's not a serious problem. Members of his middle class with horses, because that's what it took to preserve democracy in Canada. And they went farther. He sees. Was that somebody wanting to talk or? Okay, this is just another picture of my colony. You can see the, the uh, ability to take all of my racks down, down to eye level so I can change out the nests, which I do at least once a year. What you do is you take the old nesting material out, you put in new nesting material, which is generally pine needles, um, a nice layer of pine needles, and you line it with green leaves, and you put all the chicks back in, you raise the rack, and the parents are usually hanging around watching me do this. They come in, check out everything is okay, and now those chicks are more than likely gonna make it because their nest isn't wet. And here's, uh, here's uh, poles attached to the, to the uh, dock. Technically, in the state of Michigan, you're not supposed to put anything in the bottom land of a lake. I kind of learned the hard way, unless it's a dock support. Or if it's uh, some kind of a, if you use it to anchor a boat, that's okay. Uh, but the DNR doesn't, doesn't uh, respect the fact that Purple Martins are a recreational activity. So to be legal, if you have anybody on your lake that complains, you've got to attach your pole to the dock and you can drive it in the ground then, um, but you have to attach it to the dock. So I had a bad experience. I won't go into all that. Here's another picture of Purple Martins. There's my feeding tray up there. Okay, these are what the eggs in the nest look like. This is the brood patch for the parent, for the mother. Only the female has a brood patch. And here are newborn chicks. One of them hasn't even hatched yet. Notice their eyes are closed. They are totally featherless and extremely helpless. The last thing the Martins do before they lay an egg is you start to see them picking green leaves off the trees. They think they're picking the green leaves because they think it might help control the bugs in the nest. This is just another picture of uh, a natural gourd. And this is not my uh, purple Martin gourd, but it's one that I saw somewhere and apparently it's, it's successful. Again, chicks need 28 to 32 days in order to fledge. So they're spending a long time in a nest that can easily get wet. So there's another picture of chicks. This is a box that's too small. This is what I used to have. This is a six by six box. There are five babies in there, but they don't have room really to spread their wings. And that's why they're now recommending uh, much larger boxes, six by 12s, for example, and the gourds are quite large. Um, the, the birds need to spread their wings because remember when they fledge, they fledge on the fly. And if their wings aren't strong, it's gonna be bad news. So here's just more birds, pictures of some food that they like to eat. This is a sad picture. They have to kill the, the creature, the bug, before they feed it to the baby. So if the parents are young and inexperienced or careless, if a dragonfly isn't dead when they feed it to the baby, the dragonfly can actually choke the baby to death. So, you know, those are things you look for 
And you know, you're know you probably not gonna find something like that until too late, but you wanna get that deceased baby out of the nest so it doesn't uh, decay and harm the others. This is a little boy who came to visit. I love this picture. I think I'm gonna submit it for the magazine. Uh, there's a little chick. He came out and helped me do some cleaning. And here's an excellent book that anybody should read called Wingnut. And it's about Purple Martins. It's just an amazing book. It's a young adult novel. It's an easy read, but any adult would enjoy it just as much as a child. My grandson put me onto that. He's like, Grammy, you've got to, You've got to get wingnut. It's amazing. This is a little boy, a 12 year old who knows a lot more about birds than I do. He came and helped me do nest changes. He's taking the icky stuff out. He's putting in some nice new pine needles and he's got cedar shavings for the bottom. He was so excited about being able to help because most people don't get the whole babies. Here we have a nest change, that's why they're in there. We have eggshells here. Uh, here's somebody doing a bird count. This is a Purple Martin Festival. People have these all over the country. And here's again, children involved. You gotta get children involved. If kids don't learn to appreciate birds, it's almost too late once they're adults. This is a snake predator guard. This is the kind of predator guard most people in our state would have. They're extremely important. All you need is one raccoon attack and they'll totally wipe out everything. People in the South have a lot of trouble with snakes. I've never had a snake problem. Or actually I haven't had a, a raccoon problem either because I've got all my, uh, everything is kind of battened down. This is what happens. This is what sparrows and starlings do. They they pit the egg and it kills it. This is this house sparrow, a male. This is the starling. Notice he's got pinkish yellow legs and he's got a yellow beak. And as far as I'm concerned, they're not nearly as pretty as purple martins. So they're like enemy one and enemy two. And again, here is an example of how big the uh, cavity should be, the, the opening. It's called a crescent opening. And here's a purple martin nest. Here's a barn swallow nest. Uh, here's a tree swallow nest. And here is the house sparrow nest, which you've got to keep house sparrows out of your, out of your colony. There's, there's no comparison on the nest. You can easily tell this is a purple martin nest. It's quite flat. And sometimes they build mud dams, but they always have green leaves in them. And again, this is just uh, banding that we've started doing. Uh, we've, I've banded four years in a row now. Uh, this is uh, Rich and Brenda Keith. You might've heard that of them. Brenda is a hummingbird bander. She gets a hundred hummingbird bands on a card the size of a credit card. If you can imagine undoing those and putting those on hummingbirds. But they've gotten really into banding the Purple Martins. There aren't very many in Michigan banded. We put a US band on and a Michigan band um, and they band the chicks. So on any given day, depending on how many of the chicks are old enough, they have to be between 15 and 22 days old in order to be banded. Uh, last year, I think they banded 109 chicks in one day. I don't know how these people have the strength to do it because it's gotta be exhausting. And I'm there pulling down gourds and taking care of my Martins, but they're doing the real hard work. This is my sister. She came and helped one time. Who doesn't love to hold a baby bird? And here we have some chicks. These guys are about 15 days old, just the right age to be banded. And again, here's a little guy. This one's a little younger, but we banded it anyways. If their legs are swollen, they can't band them. And as the legs, legs on a bird, hard, they call it hardening off. Then they aren't as thick. They're more stick-like and rich. And Brenda can tell. So they'll look at the birds. Yeah, this will be an okay one to band. They band 
hundreds of thousands of birds in their lifetime, but these are the first purple martins they've ever banded. Okay, this is a cool picture. This little thing here, we were really concerned about that. It's actually the head of a fire ant. It must be that the parent fed this chick a live fire ant, and this is the head of it. It, it was alive, so it kind of climbed on to the mouth of the chick. And it didn't hurt the chick, we left it alone. But at that time, even the Keese had never seen this before. They had no idea what that was. We called a couple of science locations and I mean, it raised quite a big deal. Then I contacted the Purple Martin Converse Conservation Association. They told me what it was. This is a fire ant that's again, same thing, stuck to the inside of its throat. And so I was really worried about this baby, but the baby survived because you really didn't want to pull that off of the baby. First of all, it's very difficult to get the chicks to open their mouth, but um, it was quite a learning experience to see that. And that's the only year it ever happened. There must have been uh, some fire ants in our area or something, um, but we've never had it again. So I really watch for that. Here's two little chicks that have just been banded. Here's the Michigan Audubon gals that came down one time a few years ago to help me band. This is the Kalamazoo uh, Bird Sanctuary, um, Kellogg Bird Sanctuary in uh, uh, the Battle Creek area. They revived an old house and we got them to put a colony up and they've had an active colony now for about eight years. And this is just another picture of a female singing away. She's got a chick in there. She's probably got five to seven chicks in there, but that little guy stuck his head out. And again, a uh, male bringing a, a damselfly to the chicks. Uh, just another picture of the birds. Again, notice that I've got my, my gourds all numbered so I can keep track of everything. This is the man that came up with the name Michigan Purple Martin Friends. That's the name of our Facebook page. We now have about 350 members. So we'd love to have you guys join that. His name is Carl. He's from Germany. He's the coolest guy ever. He grew this giant gourd and he actually used it and had nesting going on. And he you know, gave me this picture. So. He was at a presentation I did up in Lansing a few years ago. And so I made him stand up in the audience. He had no idea I was using his slide. Uh, he's just the coolest guy. He lives over um, a little bit west of Ann Arbor. This is just another picture of a, a pole, one of my poles mounted on my shore. I've got them all on my shore now. Uh, we had a couple of trees that died. They don't want to be by trees. so. If you've got trees, you have to put them somewhere within 40 feet away from tall trees. Now I don't have tall trees anymore because they died, unfortunately. So, but the good news is I got my Martins on the, on the shore now. This is a bird friendly, friendly communities uh, a symbol that they have in Lansing. They got a grant. Tatoski could do that. We're doing it right now in Kalamazoo. We're, we're filing uh, paperwork to become an urban uh, communities, uh, bird community. And then there are grants and stuff you can get. So here's just some houses that we've erected uh, as a result of Lansing becoming a bird friendly community. Here's another one, that's my husband. Um, again, this is right along the river there in Lansing. This is me putting up a house out in Otis Bird Sang out in Otis Sanctuary, uh, kind of over in the um, what did I say west of Battle Creek, northwest of Battle Creek. Just a uh, little more pictures of what Martin colonies can look like. This is a bluebird house. If anybody hasn't tried the slotted bluebird house, I recommend it. You can get directions online. It's called a Troyer House. Um, I have not had sparrow problems in my bluebird since I've had slotted houses. And it's because sparrows, when they build a house, their hole is kind of in the middle with a, 
nests going around it. When they go in from the top, they can't do that. I, I do still get um, wrens and I will get uh, tree swallows, but I don't mind tree swallows, um, but it's just a great house. And this is, uh, I, this is what I use for a, a, a guard, a predator guard. It's just coat hangers that I've cut up and hooked on. And it's a cheap way to erect predator guards if you have a lot of bluebird houses, which I do. And then here's just some contact information. I don't know if anybody wants any of that. Feel free to contact me if you have any interest in putting up a colony or anything else. I make house calls, you know, I'm retired now. So I drive all over the place. It's kind of fun. Made a lot of friends through all this. And I am an official Purple Martin Conservation mentor. So, um, you know, people contact me also. This is another little guy who never got to hold a baby bird before. So he was just overjoyed. He's with Michiana Audubon and they came to visit us three times. Um, we did a nest change and he learned a lot and I hope he becomes a birder. And that's my husband. He's the guy who does all the real hard work with all of the poles and pulleys and uh, adding uh, guards and so on and so forth. So he's kind of gotten sucked into this whole thing. And I think he's almost as crazy about these birds as I am. And I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. I went a little over, I hope I didn't bore you folks. So I'm going to uh, take the share off and then maybe there'll be questions. Thank you very much, Penny. That was a great program. I don't think you bored anybody because we still have you know, more participants than when we started, so. Oh, good. Uh, <laughs> I never know, you know. The, you're a, you're a marvelous Martin mentor. I love my birds. And I love the, the exquisite, exquisitely engineered you know, Martin structures that your husband does. That is, he must be an engineer or a metal worker or something. Well, he's not. But a lot of this stuff you can buy and he just have to attach it. He actually made three chimney swift towers. And he's a relative novice. So you guys don't have to have an expert to build a chimney swift tower. Um, maybe you've got the directions for what they should look like and so on. Then we yeah. have to have some construction plans for that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think there are some questions. I see there's four things in the chat. I don't okay. know if you can see that. Oh. Uh, okay, uh -oh. I guess I got to go to the chat and click on it. Uh, oops, uh, do you use cedar shavings? What about bay leaves to prevent pests? Someone asks. Never heard of using bay leaves, but it might work. I mean, people have been experimenting with all kinds of things. I always put a few cedar shavings in the bottom because the idea being that that'll deter insects because as you know, you know, mites are a problem and they can actually kill the chicks. So that's another reason why you do nest checks. If you see mites or blowflies, you got to do a nest check. Um, the problem with the cedar shavings is even though they're at the very bottom, they get wet. Where pine needles, and I've, I've started using fewer and fewer cedar shavings, the nice long white pine needles, the moisture just kind of goes through them and it keeps the nest pretty dry. That being said, I still change out all my nests at least once every year. And this last year was really rainy. So I changed some nests three times. It was a lot of work. Um, I have, I'm trying to think 28, 38, 48. I have 56 nest cavities in both colonies. So that's a lot, that's a lot to keep track of, um, but it's worth it. Any other you, questions? You mentioned that you were going to show us their feet. Are they similar to, to chimney swift feet? Is that why they don't go to the ground? The reason they don't go to the ground is just because, first of all, they're aerial insectivores. They'll, they're built to fly. 
There's nothing on the ground that they really want, except they will go on the ground for nesting material and they will sometimes mate on the ground. Um, I've seen a few martins when they're really hungry, go on the ground and look for, um, oh shoot, why can't I think of it? You know, the invasive uh, shells, the invasive, what are they called? Uh, you know, we've got them down here. You guys probably have zebra mussels. Zebra mussels, thank you. And now the quagga mussels as well. I've seen them pick those up because they'll, you know, they'll eat them because it helps them with, you know, with di digestion and so on. But um, they just, they just won't go on the ground. I mean, they will, they will squawk at a chick who gets loose on the ground, who falls out of the nest or who tries to fly and doesn't make it. But what I have to do is keep my eyes open when I have birds that I think are going to be doing this. I have to put them up. I create a, on my feeding tray, I make a little tent and I put, I put uh, pine needles in it. <laughs> and I use a towel and I mean, I'll even, I, you, you wouldn't imagine how fast I can get in the water if there's a chick in the water because they can swim a little bit, but they'll end up dying if you don't find them, if you don't catch them, put them back up there, let them settle down. Uh, they'll stay up there. The parents will, will come and feed them. They know their chicks, even though you've got, you know, a hundred birds around, they know their chicks. Um, yeah, so the other thing you can do is if you're pretty sure you know what nest cavity the chick came out of, you can put it back in the nest cavity or put it in a nest cavity where the chicks are similar in age. You know, that's, those are just things that, and I'm, I'm not alone in this. You know, people who have purple martins are crazy. You know, you just do it. <laughs> other questions? Hey, I was wondering, where the name Martin came from. How come they're now called purple swallows? Is that, a, is that French for swallow or something, you know? I don't know. That's a really good question. And there are different kinds of Martins around the world. It's just that this particular Martin called a purple Martin because it's much purpler looking in the sun than other Martins. Um, I, you know, that's a good question. Why do they call them a Martin? The, the, uh, you know how all birds have a like a an abbreviation that bird people use. These guys are P U, capital P, small U, capital M, capital A, Puma. So, you know, and house sparrows are hosp. But I have no idea why they call them Martins. <laughs> I'm just curious. And also I wondered, do the same ones come back year after year to your nest or to to, to where they nested the year before? Yeah, they will. That, that's one reason why the older, stronger birds will come early. They wanna get here first and they risk their lives getting here because sometimes they get here and in the North it snows and it's a problem. If they don't have a landlord who feeds them and so on and they don't find a place where there are bugs, they'll perish. Um, but they live up to nine years and the same birds will come back every year. The chicks don't all come back. They figure about 10% of the chicks that are hatched in your colony might return to your colony or return to a colony nearby. But you mm. get the same adults back, which is kind of cool. I, I put this in the chat, Penny. You helped me last year because... I do purple martins on Lake Lansing for Michigan Audubon. Oh, and, cool. And we had a second clutch. Uh-huh. And I think you reported the same thing. And I don't think that happens very often. And yeah. I had three eggs. One died right away. One did the usual thing with how many days till it fledged. And then there was a runt left. And I changed the nest a bunch, but it had blowfly larvae in the armpits and all this kind of stuff. Anyways, I was sure the parents left. And then I found in the nest cavity, a dragonfly that was dead. Mm -hmm. And so I knew the parents were around. I couldn't hear them anymore, but they were there. And mm -hmm. that little thing took five more days, but it eventually fledged. Yep. It's so amazing. Yeah. Very good. So that was a success story. It's a new colony. Um, you know, again, you just got to fight off the house sparrows. And oh, they're horrible. Yeah. 
I know they are. <laughs> well, good for you. Thank you.